Alrighty, so today we're going to learn how to draw Bohr-Rutherford diagrams. You may remember uh, the Bohr model, right? Niels Bohr talked about electrons being found in orbits, right? Moving in circular paths around the nucleus. Rutherford did the gold foil experiment <clears throat> and he proposed a very dense, small, positively charged center of the atom. And so we're going to draw uh, Bohr-Rutherford diagrams. Looking at the notation here, we're reminded that the atomic number is the bottom number in this notation. And so this tells us the number of protons, right? Six protons. When we subtract mass minus atomic number, it tells us the number of neutrons. And if there's no charge here, then the protons equal the electrons. All right, so six protons, six electrons. So let's go ahead and draw this Bohr-Rutherford diagram. We're gonna put six protons in the middle in a cluster together with seven neutrons. Both the protons and neutrons are found in the nucleus. And now we go ahead and distribute those six electrons. So we draw one circle and place the first two electrons. If you remember from the FET simulation, when you pulled a third electron into the atom, it would not go in the first shell or the first orbit. It had to move to the second. And so that's something important then to remember about these electrons, right? Is that electrons, right, fill um, in a certain pattern, right? So they fill the shells. The first shell is full with two. And then after that, it's eight. All right, so that's why this 288 means you can put two electrons in the first shell, then you have to move to the second. Don't put more than eight here. If you still have to add more electrons, then move to the third shell. Okay, so how many electrons do I need? Six. I've put two here, so now I've got four more to go. So one, two, three, four. There we go. That's six electrons in total. One, two, three, four, five, six. Perfect. Six negatives and six positives means that the charge is neutral. There's no charge, right? Coming from protons and electrons being equal. Okay, let's try another one. We've got sodium here with a mass of 23. So you can pause the video and see if you can list your protons, neutrons, and electrons. And then try drawing your protons and neutrons in the middle and showing the orbits with the electrons. Check back with the video when you've tried the question. Okay, I've taken it this far because I wanted to place the electrons um, while you're listening. So, atomic number, 11 protons. Subtract here to get the neutrons. And because there's no charge, we're going to have the same number of protons and electrons. Alrighty, so I put protons and neutrons in the middle, draw the first orbit, and start placing electrons. One, two. Don't go higher than two in the first shell, so I draw a second shell, and I start placing these. And I can go as high as eight in this shell. Will I need all eight? Well, I will, because I need to get 11 electrons, and so far I've got one, two, if I do another 8, that'll be 10, right? And I have to get all the way up to 11. So you'll notice as I position these electrons that I'm pairing them so that it becomes really easy for me to see 2, 4, 6, 8, that I've filled that shell. And so in order to move on then, I need to draw a third shell, and that's where I place the uh, 11th electron. So there we go, we have the nucleus, three orbits or three shells, right? And you can see the electrons have been placed two, eight, one for a total of 11 electrons. I'm purposely not drawing a circle around the nucleus here. There is no membrane or anything like that. This nucleus is just a cluster of these protons and neutrons together. The first shell, right? The first circular path where we find these electrons is where these um, where I begin placing electrons. Okay, so there's a handout. We had a an explanation here, right, of how to draw these. Remember, we go back to this notation. 
Identify the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Put your protons and neutrons in the middle and then start building, placing your electrons into those shells. Looks like this. And you'll notice that in every box, I'm, I've given you the notation, right? So use what you learned there, right? This number in the bottom here is the protons. Go ahead and subtract. Oh, turns out it's zero neutrons. So you could actually not even put the neutrons there because there's none there. And then we go ahead and draw the first shell and that's where we'll put the one electron. So there you go, a hydrogen atom has one proton in the nucleus and one electron. And you can continue, right? to do helium and then lithium and so on, right? If you remember our element song that we were singing the other day, right? You can carry yourself through here. Hydrogen and helium, lithium, beryllium, and so on, right? Okay, so I realize the boxes look a little small or at least until I magnify them there. So do your best to um, fit these larger diagrams into these boxes. Okay, we'll deal with the um, uh, blanks here. Uh, actually, I suppose I better explain it in case you're actually reviewing, right? So you'll go ahead and get your diagrams done, right? And then you'll check back with the video. Okay, boy, that took a while, didn't it? All right, so every box we are making sure we take the bottom number as the number of protons, subtract to get the neutrons, so there's zero neutrons here. And then same number of protons and electrons because there's no charge. So have a look through. Okay, maybe pause the video and check through. Make sure that you've, you know, a quick way to kind of check your results here, right? Since the atomic number is increasing as you move from left to right across the period and down the table. So one proton, two protons, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten protons, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 protons. Okay, we always get the neutrons from subtracting. So seven minus three is four, nine minus four is five, and so on. And then you can go ahead and check that you've placed the right number of electrons. Always two in the first shell, and then you move to the second shell. Helium, by the way, was finished with two electrons, so it wasn't until lithium that we had to add the second shell. There goes the third electron. Beryllium, right, is going to need four electrons. One, two, oh my goodness, I did too many there. Let's back up a second here. Oops, that is a big, let's see. Okay, not letting me do that. Hang on a sec. Okay, it doesn't seem to be letting me erase that, so I'm just going to put a little X there to mark that out. All right, so there were four protons, so we make sure we have four electrons. One, two, three, four. Five protons, so five electrons. One, two, three, four, five. Six protons, six electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven protons, seven electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight protons, eight neutrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine protons, nine electrons. One, two, and then we'll have seven more to make the nine. And ten protons, so ten electrons. Two here plus eight is ten. Now when you move on to sodium, 11 protons. So now we need to go and add the um, third shell. You'll see as I count here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Then we need to go ahead and add the third shell to put the 11th electron. So you'll notice we continued to do that here. Magnesium, magnesium had two electrons in the outer shell. Aluminum had three, silicon four, phosphorus five. Um, one, two, what's going on here? Two plus eight is 10, 11, 12, 13. Oh boy, let's keep going, 14, 15, there we go. 
Sulfur had 16 protons, so 16 electrons. 2 here, plus 8 is 10, plus another 6. There we go. 17 electrons to match these 17 protons for the chlorine atom. 2 plus 8 is 10, plus 7 is 17. And 18 protons needs 18 electrons in the neutral argon atom. So 2 plus 8 plus another 8 gives us the 18. When you get down to potassium and calcium here, you find that in order to get to 19 protons for an atom of potassium, we need to go to a fourth orbit. So we draw a fourth one and it has one electron. That's the 19th electron. Go ahead and count up the dots. You'll see 19. And to finish the, the calcium atom, it will have 20 electrons to balance these 20 protons. So we have two, eight, another eight, and then another two makes the 20 electrons. Okay, so let's look for a few patterns here. All right, I'm gonna number the group numbers going across the top. This is group one. Beryllium is at the top of group two. Now you'll notice that I've squeezed out the transition metals, right, and pushed group 13 all the way over here. Then group 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. So there's the group number. All right, what does this number one have in common with each one of these diagrams? Okay, that's what I'm asking. What does the group number, which is one in this case, have, what does that have in common with each of these diagrams? Okay, when you think you've got it, look at group two. What does the number two have in common with each of these diagrams in group two? I'll give you a hint when you get to group 13, look at the second digit here. What does the number three have in common with these diagrams? And so on. The number four for group 14 and so on. Okay, so pause the video, see if you can figure out what that is. Okay, hopefully you've realized that each one of these diagrams has one electron in the last orbit one electron in the last orbit, all the way down. That's how it worked. In group two, there's two electrons in the last orbit, the outermost shell. Two electrons, one, two for calcium. See that in the outermost shell. When you get to a double digit group number, like group 13, there are three electrons in the outer shell. See that for aluminum also here. When you go over to carbon, in group 14, there are four valence or four electrons in the outer shell. Five for each of nitrogen and phosphorus, right? Six electrons for oxygen and sulfur in the last orbit. Seven valence electrons in the outside orbit for fluorine and chlorine. And except for helium, these noble gases have eight electrons in their outer shell. Why does helium not have eight? Well, it didn't even have eight electrons to begin with, right? With only two protons, a neutral atom of helium will have two electrons. So you might think, why is helium over here? Why is helium over here? If it has two electrons in the outer shell, how come it's not over in this group? Why wouldn't they put helium here? So, what is super special about the outer shell of these atoms? And it's true for each one of these diagrams, and it's not the case for the rest of these. Notice how this outer shell is the first shell, and it's full with two electrons. Notice this outer shell, the second shell, it's full with eight electrons. Notice here, the third shell is the outer shell, and it's full with eight electrons. That is super important. The outer shell, right, in all of these diagrams here, the outer shell is full. And, by the way, there's a term for that. That outer shell, okay, we call it the valence shell. Okay, so the valence shell is full. The outer shell is full. And that's hugely important because that means that this atom is stable. I don't mean stable in terms of the nucleus with protons and neutrons. I mean stable in terms of reactivity. 
when the atom is stable, then it's not going to lose or gain these electrons easily. It's not going to form compounds. And that's why you wrote down that these noble gases are very unreactive. Why are they so unreactive, inert? Because they are stable, right, due to this full valence shell, this full outer shell. If you notice, none of the rest of these atoms have full valence shells, right? Seven is not full, eight would be full, right? Two is not full, eight would be full. So remember that. All right, so that's why the rest of these atoms react but the noble gases don't. Good idea to put helium in your birthday balloon, not hydrogen, because hydrogen will react, but helium won't. Okay, so that group number, if we want to just summarize here, that group number tells us the number of electrons in the outer shell, right? Electrons in the outer shell. And we have a shorter way to communicate that, right? These are known as valence electrons. The group number tells us the number of valence electrons. What are the valence electrons? They're the electrons in the outer shell or the outer orbit. For calcium, there's two. Okay, what about the period number? What does the period number tell us? Well, let's go ahead and number them. Period one, two, three, four. That's all I have here. So period one, hydrogen and helium. What does the number one have in common with these two diagrams? Ah, one shell. What's the number two have in common with all of these diagrams? One, two, one, two, one, two. Do you see that there's two shells all the way across? How about the number three? One, two, three shells all the way across. Number four, period four, one, two, three, four, four shells. Aha, so that's pretty important. The period number tells us the number of shells, or if you like to say orbits, or you could say energy levels. All right, so that's gonna be really helpful. When you look at a periodic table, right, even francium, way down at the bottom, right? Way down at the bottom. Francium is like way down here, right? It's way down at the bottom of group one. Because it's in group one, the group number tells us the number of electrons in the outer shell, the number of valence electrons. That means, right, in the last shell of a francium atom, there's only gonna be one electron, just like there was for all of these. Now, Francium's in period seven. What does that mean about a francium atom? It's going to have seven shells. Yes, seven of them. I'm never gonna ask you to draw a diagram, a bohr rutherford diagram for anything higher than calcium. That's as high as you have to go. And truthfully, the Bohr model isn't even the current model of the atom. But we teach all of grade nine, 10, and 11 chemistry with the Bohr model. So it's actually quite useful, but unfortunately isn't actually fully correct. So the quantum model of the atom is actually the current model of the atom, and there's a ton of evidence and support to suggest that that's, uh, you know, a very good model of the atom. So we learn about that in Ontario here in grade 12 chemistry. Okay, so here you go, Bohr-Rutherford diagrams of atoms. All right, okay. So far I've just done atoms, right? I've just done atoms. It's actually, um, uh, you know, next year's concept to look at ions. If you actually did provide a table of ions where you could actually try to predict the charge or predict the um, charge of these ions, but We'll save that for another day. If you want, you can look into um, uh, a video in my grade 11 chemistry playlist from unit one, where it goes through the uh, formation of ions, if you're interested, okay? But our, our um, content is really limited here to these Bohr-Rutherford diagrams of atoms.